everybody. I'm Miss Carrie. I'm the teen librarian at Racine Public, and I'm here for another First Chapter Friday. And I have one of my favorites today. I was looking for the book because it went lost in my house, but I finally found it, and I'm able to share it with you. And it is The Lady's Guide to Petticoats and Piracy. It's a sequel, actually. It's the follow-up to The Gentleman's Guide to Vice and Virtue, which I also really, really loved. But this one, it uh, focuses on the sister of the main character in the first book, and she's just amazing. I love Felicity. The book is set in a, sort of a nebulous time in the 1700s, and it's an adventure story. It really, really is. It's You don't get a really good adventure story these days, at least not, not in YA. I mean, it's got maps. <laughs> Her to follow. But Felicity wants to be a doctor. And she's a relatively well born young lady. And relatively well born young ladies at the time aren't really meant to go on and be doctors, to have careers. They're meant to, to marry well and, and just be ladies. And that is not at all what Felicity wants. She wants to go and study, particularly with one doctor who has been her sort of role model that she's wanted to follow all these times. And she feels like he's progressive enough that maybe it'll work out. But along the way of trying to get there to him, to travel by herself, she picks up a traveling partner and then there ends up being all sorts of antics and, and romps through, through Europe at the time. It's the first book was similar where they ended up traveling around, uh, avoiding highwaymen and pirates. And this one has just as many <laughs> madcap adventures. It's fantastic. So the first chapter, Mackenzie Lee's Lady's Guide to Petticoats and Piracy. Edinburgh. Chapter one. I have just taken an overly large bite of iced bun when Callum slices his finger off. We're in the middle of our usual nightly routine. After the bakery is shut and the lamps along the cow gate are lit, their syrupy glow creating halos against the twilight. I wash the day's dishes and Callum dries. Since I'm always finished first, I get to dip into whatever baked goods are left over from the day while I wait for him to count the till. Still on the counter are the three iced buns I've been eyeing all day. The sort Callum piles with sticky, translucent frosting to make up for all the years his father, who had the shop before him, skimped on it. Their domes are beginning to collapse from a long day unpurchased, the cherries that top them slipping down the sides. Unfortunately, I have never been a girl overbothered with aesthetics. I would have happily tucked into buns far uglier than these. Callum's always a bit of a hand wringer, who doesn't enjoy eye contact, but he's jumpier than usual tonight. He stepped on a butter mold this morning, cracking it in half, and burned two trays of brioche. He fumbles every dish I pass him and stares up at the ceiling as I prod the conversation along, his already ruddy cheeks going even redder. I do not particularly mind being the foremost conversationalist out of the pair of us. Even on his chattiest days, I usually am, or he lets me be. As he finishes drying the cutlery, I am telling him about the time that has elapsed since the last letter I sent to the Royal Infirmary about my admission to their teaching hospital and the private physician who last week responded to my request to sit in on one of his dissections with a three-word missive. No, thank you. Maybe I need a different approach, I say, pinching the top off an iced bun and bringing it up to my lips, though I know full well it's too large for a single bite. Callum looks up from the knife he's wiping and cries, Wait, don't eat that! with such vehemence that I startle, and he startles, and the knife pops through the towel and straight through the tip of his finger. There's a small plop as the severed tip lands in the dish water. The blood starts at once, dripping from his hand and into the soapy water, where it blossoms through the suds like poppies bursting from their buds. All the color leaves his face as he stares down at his hand and then says, oh dear. It is, I must confess, the most excited I have ever been in Callum's presence. I can't remember the last time I was so excited. Here I am with an actual medical emergency and no male physicians to push me out of the way to handle it. With a chunk of his finger missing, Callum is the most interesting he has ever been to me. I leaf through the mental compendium of medical knowledge I've compiled over years of study, and I land, as I almost always do, on Dr. Alexander Platt's Treatise on Human Blood and Its Movement Through the Body. In it, he writes that hands are complex instruments. Each contains 27 bones, four tendons, three main nerves, two arteries, two major muscle groups, and a complex network of veins that I am still trying to memorize, all wrapped up in tissue and skin and capped with fingernails. 
There are sensory components and motor functions affecting everything from the ability to take a pinch of salt to bending at the elbow that begin in the hand and run all the way into the arm, any of which can be mucked up by a misplaced knife. Callum is staring wide-eyed at his finger, still as a rabbit by the snap of a snare, making no attempt to staunch the blood. I snatch the towel from his hand and swaddle the tip of his finger in it, for the priority when dealing with a wound spouting excessive blood is to remind the blood that it'll do far more good inside the body than out. It soaks through the cloth almost immediately, leaving my palms red and sticky. My hands are steady, I notice with a blush of pride, even after the good jolt my heart was given when the actual severing occurred. I have read the books. I have studied anatomical drawings. I once cut open my own foot in a horribly misguided attempt to understand what the blue veins I can see through my skin look like up close. And though comparing books about medicine to the actual practice is like comparing a garden petal to the ocean, I am as prepared for this as I could possibly be. This is not how I envisioned attending to my first true medical patient in Edinburgh, in the back room of a tiny bake shop that I've been toiling in to keep myself afloat between a failed petition after a failed petition to the university and a whole slew of private surgeons begging for permission to study. But after the year I've had, I'll take whatever opportunities to put my knowledge into practice that are presented. Gift horses and mouths and all that. Here, sit down. I guide Callum to the stool behind the counter where I take coins from his customers, for I can make change faster than Mr. Brown, the second clerk. Hand over your head, I say, for if nothing else, gravity will work in favor of keeping his blood inside his body. He obeys. I then fish the wayward fingertip from the wash basin, coming up with several chunks of slimy dough before I finally find it. I turn, return to Callum, who still has both hands over his head so that it looks, like he's, looks as though he's surrendering. He's pale as flour, or perhaps that is actually flour dusting his cheeks. He's not a clean sort. Is it bad? He croaks. Well, it's not good, but it certainly could have been worse. Here, let me have a look. He starts to unwrap the towel, and I qualify, no, lower your arms, I can't look at it all the way up there. The bleeding has not stopped, but it has slowed enough that I can remove the towel long enough for a look. The finger is less severed than I expected. While he sliced off a good piece of his fingertip, a fingerprint, and a wicked crescent of the nail, the bone is untouched. If one must lose a part of one's finger, this is the best that can be hoped for. I pull the skin on either side of the wound up over it. I have a sewing kit in my bag, as I have three times lost the button from my cloak this winter and grew tired of walking around with the ghastly wind of the Norloch flap flapping its tails. All it takes is three stitches, in a style I learned not from a general system of surgery, but rather from the hideous pillow cover my mother pestered me into embroidering a daft-looking dog upon, to hold the flap in place. A few drops of blood still ooze up between the stitches, and I frown down at them. Had they truly been upon a pillowcase, I would have ripped them out and tried again. But, considering how little practice I've had with sealing an amputation, particularly one so small and delicate, and how much it slowed the bleeding, I allow myself a moment of pride before I move on to the second priority of Dr. Platt's treaty on wounds of the flesh, holding infection at bay. Stay here, I say, as though he has any inclination to move. I'll be right back. In the kitchen, I bring water to a quick boil over the stove, still warm and easily stoked, then add wine and vinegar before soaking a towel in the mixture and returning to where Callum is sitting, wide-eyed, behind the counter. You're not going to... Do you have to... Cut it off? He asks. No, you already did that, I reply. We're not amputating anything, just cleaning it up. Oh. He looks at the wine bottle in my fist and swallows hard. I thought you were trying to douse me. I thought you might want it. I offer him the bottle, but he doesn't take it. I was saving that. What for? Here, give me your hand. I blot the stitching, which is much cleaner than I had previously thought. I'm far too hard on myself. With the soaked towel. Callum coughs with his cheeks puffed out when the vinegar tang strikes the air. Then it's a strip of cheesecloth around the finger, bound and tucked. Stitched, bandaged, and sorted. I haven't even broken a sweat. A year of men telling me I am incapable of this work only gives my pride a more savage edge, and I feel, for the first time in so many long, cold, discouraging months, that I am as clever and capable and fit for the medical profession as any of the men who have denied me a place in it. I wipe my hands off on my skirt and straighten, surveying the bakery. In addition to every other task that needs doing before we close up for the night, the dishes will need to be rewashed. There's a long dribble of blood along the floor that'll have to be scrubbed before it dries, another on my sleeve, and a splatter across Callum's apron that should be soaked out before tomorrow. There is also a fingertip to be disposed of. Beside me, Callum takes a long, deep breath and lets it hiss out between pursed lips as he examines his hand. Well, this rather spoils the night. We were just washing up. Well, I had something else pushes his chin against his chest. For you. Can it wait? I ask. 
I'm already calculating how long this will leave Callum useless over the ovens, whether Mr. Brown will be able to lend a hand, how much this will cut into my time off this week, which I had planned to use to begin a tr draft of a treaty in favor of educational equality. No, it's not. I mean, I suppose it could, but he's picking at the edges of the bandage, but stops before I can reprimand him. He's still pale, but a bit of the ruddiness is starting to return to the apples of his cheeks. It's not something that'll last. Is it something for eating? I ask. Something of a... Just stay there. He wobbles to his feet in spite of my protestations and disappears into the kitchen. I hadn't noticed anything special when I was mixing the wine and vinegar, but I also hadn't been particularly looking for it. I check my fingers for blood, then swipe a clean one over the iced bun I had previously targeted. Don't strain yourself, I call him. I'm not, he replies, immediately followed by a crash like something tin knocked over. I'm fine. Don't come back here. He appears behind the counter again, more red-faced than before, and one sleeve sopping with what must have been the milk he so raucously spilled. He's also clutching a fine china plate before him in presentation, and upon it sits a perfect single cream puff. My stomach drops, the sight of that pastry sending a tremble through me that a waterfall of blood had not. What are you eating? He asks, at the same moment I say, what is that? He sets the plate on the counter, then holds out his uninjured hand in presentation. It's a cream puff. I can see that. It is more specifically because I know you love specificity. I do, yes. Exactly the cream puff I gave you the day we met. His smile falters and he qualifies, well, not exactly that one, as that was months ago. And since you ate that one and several more, why did you make me this? I look down at the two chew halves with whirls of thick cream sculpted between them. He's never this careful with his craftsmanship. His loaves and cakes the kind of rustic you'd expect to be made by a big-handed baker of good scotch stock. But this is so de deliberate and decorative and sounds, I can't believe I know exactly what type of pastry this is and how important it is to let the flour mixture cool before whisking in the egg. All this baking nonsense is taking up important space in my head that should be filled with notations on treating popliteal aneurysms and the different types of hernias outlined in treatise on ruptures, which I took great pains to memorize. Maybe we should sit down, he says. I'm a little faint, likely because you lost blood. Or, yes, that must be it. This really can't wait, I ask, as I lead him over to one of the tables crowded in front of the shop. He carries the cream puff, and it wobbles on the plate as his hand shakes. You should go home and rest. At least close the shop tomorrow, or Mr. Brown can supervise the apprentices, and we can keep everything simple. They can't knock up a bread roll too badly. He makes to pull the chair out for me, but I wave him away. If you are insistent upon moving forward with whatever this is, at least sit down before you fall over. We take opposite sides, pressed up against the cold, damp window. Down the road, the clock from St. Giles is striking the hour. The buildings along the Cowgate are gray with the twilight, and the sky is gray, and everyone passing the bakery is wrapped in gray wool, and I swear I haven't seen color since I came to this godforsaken place. Callum sets the cream puff on the table between us, then stares at me, fiddling with his sleeve. Oh, the wine! He casts a glance over at the counter, seems to decide it's not worth going back for, then looks again at me, my hand, his hands resting on the tabletop. His knuckles are cracked from the dry winter air fingernails short and chewed raw around the edges. Do you remember the first day we met? He blurts. I look down at the cream puff, dread beginning to spread in my stomach like a drop of ink in water. I remember quite a lot of days. But that one in particular? Yes, of course. It was a humiliating day. It still stings to think about it. Having written three letters to the university on the subject of my admission and received not a word in reply for over two months, I went to the office myself to investigate whether they arrived. As soon as I gave my name to the secretary, he informed me that my correspondence had indeed been, been received, but no, it had not been passed on to the Bar Board of Governors. My petition had been denied without ever being heard because I was a woman and women were not permitted to enroll in the hospital teaching courses. I was then escorted from the building by a soldier on patrol, which just seemed excessive, though it would be a lie to say I did not consider sprinting past the secretary and bursting through the door into the governor's hall without permission. I wear practical shoes and can run very fast. But having been unceremoniously deposited upon the street, I had consoled myself at the bake shop across the road, drowning my sorrows in a cream puff made for me by a round-faced baker with the figure of a man to whom cakes are too available. When I had tried to pay him for it, he'd given me my coins back. And as I was finishing it, at this very table, beside this very window, oh, Callum was truly digging in the talons of sentimentality by sitting us here, he made a tentative approach with a mug of warm cider and, after a good chat, an offer of employment. He had looked then like he was trying to lure a snappish dog in from the cold to lie beside his fire, like he knew what was best for me if only my stubborn heart could be enticed there. He looks the same way now. 
earnestly presenting me with the same sort of cream puff, his chin tipped down so that he's looking up at me through the hedgerow of his eyebrows. Felicity, he says, my name wobbling in his throat. We've known each other for a while now. We have, I say, and the dread thickens. And I've become quite fond of you, as you know. I do. And I did. After months of counting coins with my side pressed against his in the cramped space behind the counter and our hands overlapping when he passed me trays of warm rolls, it had become apparent that Callum was fond of me in a way I couldn't make myself be fond of him. And though I had known of the existence of this fondness for a time, it had not been a matter of any urgency that required addressing. But now he's giving me a cream puff and recollecting, telling me how fond he is of me. I jump when he takes my hand across the table, an impulsive lunging gesture. He pulls away just as fast, and I feel terrible for startling, so I hold my hand out in invitation and let him try again. His palms are sweating, and my grip's so unenthusiastic, I imagine it must be akin to cuddling a filleted fish. Felicity, he says, and then again, I'm very fond of you. Yes, I say. Very fond. Yes. I try to focus on what he's saying and not of how to get my hand out of his without hurting his feelings. And also, if there's any possible scenario in which I can walk away from this with that cream puff, but without having to do any more than hold his hand. Felicity, he says again. And when I look up, he's leaning across the table toward me with his eyes closed and his lips jutting out. And here it is, the inevitable kiss. When Callum and I first met, I had been lonely enough to not only accept his employment, but also the companionship that came with it, which gave him the idea that men often get in their heads when a woman pays some kind of attention to them, that it was a sign I want him to smash his mouth, and possibly other body parts, against mine, which I do not. But I closed my eyes and let him kiss me. It was more of a lunge into the initial pr approach than I would prefer, and our teeth knock in a way that makes me wonder if there's a business in selling Dr. John Hunter's newly advertised live tooth transplants to women who have been kissed by overly enthusiastic men. It's nowhere near as unenjoyable as my only previous experience with the act, though just as wet and just as dispassionate a gesture, the oral equivalent of a handshake. Best to get it over with, I think. So I stay still and let him press his lips to mine, feeling as though I'm being stamped like a ledger, which is apparently the wrong thing to do, because he stops very abruptly and falls back into his chair, wiping his mouth on his sleeve. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. No, it's all right, I say quickly. And it was. It hadn't been hostile or forced upon me. Had I turned away, I know he wouldn't have chased me, because Callum is a good man. He walks outside on the outside of the pavement so that he takes the splash of the carriage wheels through the snow instead of me. He listens to every story I tell, even when I know I've been taking up more than my share of the conversation. He stopped adding almonds to the sweetbreads when I told him that almonds make my throat itch. Felicity, Callum says, I'd like to marry you. Then he drops off his chair and lands with a hard thunk against the floor that makes me concerned for his kneecaps. Sorry, I got the order wrong. I almost, I almost dropped too, though not in chivalry. I'm feeling far fainter in the face of matrimony than I did at the sight of half a finger in the dishwater. What? Did you... He swallows so hard that I see his throat travel the entire course of his neck. Did you not know that I was going to ask you? In truth, I had expected nothing more than a kiss, but suddenly feel foolish for thinking that was all he wanted from me. I fumble around for an explanation for my willful ignorance and only come up with, we hardly know each other. We've known each other almost a year, he replies. A year is nothing, I protest. I've had dresses I wore for a year and then woke up one morning and thought, why am I wearing this insane dress that makes me look like a terrier mated with a lobster? You never look like a lobster, he says. I do when I wear red, I say, and when I blush. And my hair is too red. And I wouldn't have, had, wouldn't have time to plan a wedding right now because I'm busy and tired. And I have so much to read. And I'm going to London. You are, he asks. You are, I ask myself. At the same time, I hear myself saying, yes, I'm leaving tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yes, tomorrow. Another revelation to myself. I have no plans to go to London. It sprang from me, a spontaneous and fictitious excuse crafted entirely from panic. But he's still on his knee, so I push on with it. I have to see my brother there. He has... I pause too long for my next word to be anything but a lie. Then say, syphilis. It's the first thing that comes to mind when I think of Monty. Oh. Oh, dear. Callum, to his credit, seems to be making a true effort to understand my nonsensical ramblings. Well, no, not syphilis, I say. But he's having terrible spells of boredom and asks me to come and read to him. And I'm going to be petitioning the hospital for admission again in the spring when they bring in new attending physicians, and that will take all my attention. Well, if we married, you wouldn't have to worry about that. Worry about what, I ask? Planning the wedding? 
No. He picks himself up off his bended knee and sinks back into his chair with far more slump to his shoulders than before. About schooling? I want to worry about that, I reply, the back of my neck prickling. I'm going to get a license and become a physician. But that will... He stops, teeth pressing so hard against his bottom lip that it models white. I fold my arms. That will what? You're not serious about that, are you? If I wasn't serious, I wouldn't have been able to sew you up just now. I know you'd still be bleeding out over your wash basin. I know that, and that was... You did a wonderful job. He reaches out like he might pat my hand, but I pull it off the table, for I am not a dog and therefore need no patting. We all have silly things that we... we want. Dreams, you know. And then one day you... He scoops at the air with a hand like he's trying to conjure appropriate phraseology between us rather than be forced to say what he means. For example, when I was a boy, I wanted to train tigers for the Tower Menagerie in London. So train tigers, I reply flatly. He laughs, small nervous trill. Well, I don't want to anymore because I have the shop and I have a house here. What I meant is we all have silly things that we lose interest in because we want something real, like a house and a shop and a spouse and children. No, not today, he stammers, for I must look petrified, but someday. A different sort of dread begins to distill inside me now, strong and bitter as whiskey. Silly little things. It's all he thought my grand ambitions ever were. All this time, all these chats over scones, all his intense listening to me explain how, if the head were to be sawed off a corpse, one could trace paths of the twelve nerves connecting the brain all the way to the body. One of the few who had not told me to give up, even when I nearly told myself to, when I had written to surgeon after surgeon in the city, begging for teaching and received only rejections. I hadn't even been granted a single meeting once they discovered I was a woman. All the while we'd been together, he'd been wondering what, when it was that I'd give up on this passing fancy like it was a fashion trend that would disappear from shop windows by the end of the summer. I'm not training tigers, I say. It's medicine. I want to be a doctor. I know, they're not even comparable. There are doctors all over the city. No one would say it was silly or impossible if I was a man. You couldn't train tigers because you're just a baker from Scotland, but I have actual skills. His face falls before I register what I've said and I try to backstep. Not that you, sorry, I didn't mean that. I know, he says, but, Someday you'll want something real, and I'd like to be that something for you. He looks very intently at me, and I think he wants me to say something to assure him that I take his meaning, and yes, he's right. I'm just a flighty thing with a passing interest in medicine that can be siphoned off once a ring is placed upon my finger. But all I can think to say is a snappish, maybe someday stars will fall from the sky. So I offer nothing in return but a frosty stare, the sort of look my brother once told me could put out a cigar. Callum tucks his chin into his chest, then blows out a long, hard breath that ruffles his fringy hair. And if you don't want that too, then I don't want to do this anymore. Do what? I don't want you working here whenever you need money, and showing up any hour you please, and eating all the buns, and taking advantage of me because you know I have an affection for you. I either want to marry you, or I don't want to see you anymore. I can't argue with any of that, though the fact my heart sinks far further at the thought of losing this job than of losing Callum speaks volumes about the ill-advised nature of a union between us. I'm sure I could find something else to sustain me in this bleak, punishing city, but it would likely be even more menial and tedious than counting coins in a bakery, and would most certainly not include free desserts. I'd ruin my eyes making buttons in the smoggy factory, or wear myself ragged as a domestic, be blind and bent and consumptive by 25, and medical school would be soundly put to bed before I'd had a proper shot. We stare at each other. I'm not sure if he wants me to apologize or agree or admit that, yes, that's what I've been doing, and yes, I know I've been using him badly, and yes, I will agree to his proposal in penance, and it will all have been worth it. But I stay quiet. We should finish cleaning up, he says at last, standing up and wiping his hands off on his apron with a wince. You can eat the cream puff, even if you can't say yes right now. I wish I could believe that yes was inevitable, the same way he seems to. It would be so much easier to want to say yes, to want a house on the cowgate and a whole brood of round doyle children with stubby Montague legs and a solid life with this kind, solid man. A small part of me, the part that traces my finger in the sifted sugar dusted around the edges of the shoe and almost calls him back, knows that there are far worse things for a woman to be than a kind man's wife. It would be so much easier than being a single-minded woman with a chalk drawing on the floor of her boarding house bedroom, mapping out every vein and nerve and artery and organ she reads about, adding notations about the size and properties of each. It would be so much easier if I did not want to know everything so badly. 
if I did not want so badly to be reliant upon no soul but myself. When Monty, Percy, and I returned to England after what can generously be called a tour, the idea of life in Edinburgh as an ed independent woman was thrilling. The university had a newly minted medical school, the Royal Infirmary allowed, Infirmary allowed student observation, an anatomy theater was being built in the college garden. It was the city where Alexander Platt had arrived after his dishonorable Navy discharge with no references and no prospects, and had made a name for himself simply by refusing to stop talking about the radical notions that had gotten him booted from the service. Edinburgh had given Alexander Platt a leg up from nothing because it had seen in him a brilliant mind, no matter that it came from a working class lad with no experience and a stripped title. I was certain that it could do the same for me. Instead, here I was in a bake shop with a proposal pastry. Callum is kind, I tell myself as I stare at the cream puff. Callum is sweet. Callum loves bread and wakes up early and cleans up after himself. He doesn't mind that I don't wear cosmetics and make very little attempt to dress my hair. He listens to me and doesn't make me feel unsafe. I could do much worse than a kind man. The scent of sugar and wood smoke starts to return to the room as Callum smothers the ovens, drowning out the faint hint of blood that still lingers, sharp and metallic as a new sewing needle. I do not want to spend the rest of my life smelling sugar. I don't want pastry under my fingernails and a man content with the hand life has dealt him and my heart a hungry, wild creature savaging me from the inside out. Fleeing to London, had truly been a fiction, but suddenly it begins to unspool in my head. London isn't a medical hub like Edinburgh, but there are hospitals and plenty of physicians who offer private classes. There's a guild. None of the hospitals or private offices or even barbaric barber surgeons on the grass market have allowed me to get a toe in their door. But the hospitals in London don't know my name. I'm smarter now after a year of rejection. I've learned not to walk in with pistols drawn, but rather to keep them hidden in my petticoats with a hand surreptitiously upon the heel. This time, I will approach stealthily, find a way to make them let me in before I ever have to show my hand. And what's the point of having a fallen gentleman in the city for a brother if I don't take advantage of his gentlemanly hospitality? You want to pick this one up. Mackenzie Lee, Lady's Guide to Petticoats and Piracy. Thank you.